I also thank you for <clears throat> your continual gifts of giving to this place. We, part- we appreciate what you've given. We appreciate your offerings. We appreciate your obedience to the Lord. So thank you for doing that as well. And thank you for continuing to pray for us in this place because we need prayer. Someone say amen right there, right? <laughs> We're praying for you. You're praying for us. We're praying together because God is and has been responding to our prayer. And there's something for each and every one of us to be thankful for. So you guys ready to jump into Proverbs again today? Three of you are. Okay. <laughs> We're jumping into Proverbs. So there, by the way, there are notes if you are looking for notes in the back. Often I go through lots of material, sometimes too much material, but they're back there for you. If you want to follow along, you can download them if you're online, take a look at those things, and hopefully they will help you focus in on what God would be saying to us. So today is part two of our series, and if you were with us last week, we really focused in on one verse, the opening line where we understand who wrote the majority of what has been given to us and what his connection was to David the king. If you remember, we went back to 1 Kings looking at Solomon. And we saw in there God's mercy. Remember this? That God shows in his mercy an unlikely candidate to continue with the blessing in the line and the promise of King David. He chose Solomon. And Solomon received that mercy. And Solomon received God's love. And in receiving it, he reflected it to God in worshiping him and following him the best way he knew. As he was worshiping, and that night God met Solomon in a dream, and he asked him, what can I give you, Solomon? And Solomon recognized the mercy of God. He recognized the love of God. He recognized his own inability to do what God has asked him to do. He's like, I am a child, even though he was probably a man in his 40s. I am just a child. This task, these people, what you've given me to do is much greater and much bigger than I am. And so he could have asked for anything. And the one thing that he chose was to be empowered, giving wisdom to do what God asked him to do. And God was very pleased by this request. So much so that he poured upon this man, Solomon, great wisdom far greater than any person in the past and any person, of course, besides Jesus in the future. And he granted him also the things that he did not ask for out of his mercy. So these things remind us also, one, to ask God for what we need to do, what he's asked us to do. He does indeed have a calling. He does have a task. He does have a work for each and every one of us to do. Like I said last week, there is no unemployment in the kingdom of God, right? We all have a task. We all have a neighborhood. We all have a calling. And God invites us into what he is doing on this world, okay? What he is doing, God, what are you doing and how can I be involved in it? Often we ask God to be involved in our life, where our better prayer is to ask God what he's doing and being involved in his, okay? So God, what are you doing? What are you saying? And how can I participate in that? So we can receive God's mercy. We can receive God's wisdom as we understand in humility that we need God to do God's will. And we can say amen to that. So this is Solomon, right? And his words, along with other people's words, were collected together. And this is God's word to us, the wisdom of God laid out for the people of God to engage their self with it. And today, as we extend this uh, next part of this series to verse 7, okay, we're going all the way down to verse 7. This section is really an advertisement of saying, hey, I invite you to read these words. He's saying, this is how it's going to profit you. And this also is who it's for. We'll say, well, it's just for young people. It's not, okay? It's for all people. And so it opens up with words of invitation. and saying, this is what it will do. This is who is invited. And then in verse 7, we see this theme 
of the fear of the Lord being the beginning of knowledge. So this morning, we're going to look at this invitation. We're going to look at who this book is for. And then we're going to unpack to a degree the primary theme of the book of Proverbs. So this is where we are going this morning. Proverbs is written to give you encouragement and hope to equip you so that you can persevere with strength and insight and wisdom of God. This is why these are given, and I encourage you to give yourself over to them. So this is our first main point. Reap the rewards from the book of Proverbs. This is how I want you to engage, and we're going to look at some of the rewards that are detailed for us in this book. So it opens up, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Verse 2. For gaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instructions and in doing what is righteous and just and fair. Okay, we're going to cut this a little um, thinly. So here it is, verse 2. So this is why this book was given. For gaining wisdom. This is what this means. The purpose of Proverbs is to give you the ability to know what to do. Is that not a gift? Right? How often in your life up to this point have you debated about what you should do. We're always facing choices, from the mundane of what to wear in the morning and what to eat, to the large, where to live, or who to be married to, or how to, or where to pursue God. We have choices all of the time, and often we don't know what to do. Well, I can see this, or I can go do this. I can see that, or I can do that. And often... And when we are confused, we make poor decisions. Did anyone here ever make a poor decision in their life, right? Whoa! I could be the poster child sometimes, right? Here I am. Don't do what I did, okay? Sometimes we make good decisions. So if you want to have the ability to do or to know what to do, read this book. It is given for gaining wisdom. And I don't know one person who cannot use more wisdom in your life. God gives us wisdom to follow. It is for the asking and it is for the seeking. Remember when James recorded these words in the New Testament? Remember this, James chapter 1 verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him, let her Ask God, who thinks about it for a while and kind of ponders if they should give it to you. Right? Is that what it says? Right? If any of you lacks wisdom, our first response is to ask God. Right? Who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. So ask, seek. Look, it'll be given to you. And often when we do not, we end up in bad places making bad choices. So this book was given to us for gaining wisdom. Second, and discipline. So the purpose of Proverbs is to coach you to excel. That's what it's given. This word discipline isn't like, son, come here, Right? It's not that word of discipline. The word of discipline is like a coach, right? Any of you have been coached before, right? I've been coached. In high school, I ran track, I played basketball, I played football. We loved our coach. We hated our coach, right? Remember two-a-day football in 
late August where you have your football pads on and the sun's beating down. You have a practice in the morning and you puke. You have a practice in the afternoon and you puke, right? Why? Because the coach pushed us so hard, right? Running and running and running and tackling. And I was a wide receiver and a defensive back and he worked us hard. Now, we had a very, very winning program. We didn't actually lose a game at home for 10 years straight, okay? We were feared, right? We were fierce. I had stickers stickers all over my helmet, M&Ms. They they said M&M on it. It was like, oh, M&Ms, not those. meant mean mothers. (laughs) I'm sorry, that's what it meant. And you got a sticker every time you put someone on their back. And I had lots of stickers, right? Now, I was put on my back a few times, believe me, right? I hated him during the preseason, but I loved him during the regular season, right? Because he taught us to be disciplined, so I didn't have to think about it, right? Your body reacted, right? You were physically conditioned, better conditioned than the other team, right? They may be beating us in the first quarter, but we're going to come after you in the fourth, right? We're going to wear you down. So this is what it's talking about. This discipline, it gives us a coach, right? You don't always like what the coach tells you to do, but you will like the results, I promise you. So the book of Proverbs is like a coach that will discipline us, so we are disciplined, right? So we get up in the morning and hit the weight room, okay? You get up and you do what has to be done because you're disciplined, you're disciplined, you're disciplined, right? Laziness is not a virtue, okay? Can you rest? Yes. Should you rest? Yes. But God worked for how many days? Six. Rested one, which tells me we should be active working much more than we're passively resting. Discipline. A coach that helps us to excel. God wants you to excel. And people get into all types of foolish traps, bad decisions, because they haven't given themselves over to discipline, because they haven't given themselves under the Word of God. So Proverbs and the wisdom of God is given to us so that we can be coached to excel. It's given to us for understanding words of insight. Again, this is verse 2. So the purpose of Proverbs is to give you the capacity to understand complex things. For understanding words of insight. The Proverbs break down life into its component parts. So that we can understand how it fits together. To know what is needed for life to run well. And when it does not, what is needed to be repaired or replaced. Just like a good mechanic. That when you go to the mechanic, the mechanic have things like this. You see this chart? That looks a little complex, right? It is complex. But it breaks down the component parts of this engine, right? And so that the mechanic can understand this is how this piston works, this is how this casing works, this is where this seal goes, this is how it is put together. So you can see it so that when it's all put together properly, this engine will run well. Life is like that as well. There are various component parts in our relationships, in our work, in our connection to God, with our marriage, with our children, with our grandchildren, with our co-workers, with our, inside of ourselves, okay? Lots of different component parts in a complex um, life that we have. Proverbs is a good guide that will pull life apart so we can say, oh, you know what? My issue is right over here. That we can replace a part and so that we can put it back together again so life runs smoothly and works correctly. 
If you find yourself continuing to trip over the same thing over and over and over and over again and wondering what is going wrong, I encourage you and the Word implores you to read and to seek and to ask for wisdom. And His Word breaks things apart so we can look at it, so it can be put back together in correct order. So Proverbs is giving for understanding and insight into words of insight. Also, next, for receiving instructions and doing what is right. This is the same word for coach. It's coaching us. Hey, this is what you do in this circumstance. For the purpose of Proverbs is to coach you to do what is righteous. More than just doing what is right. Okay? This is doing what's in right in God's sight. God, what would bring most honor to you? God, what would be most fulfilling and purposeful in your economy? God, what makes the biggest difference for eternity? So this is beyond just doing what is right, but doing what is righteous. That we can make good choices instead of flawed choices based on bad information. Receiving instruction and in doing what is righteous. Okay, my notes went away. Here they are. Okay, this is what was given to us. So the Proverbs are given as a coach that we can view our actions in light of eternity. I don't know about you, but if I get away from the Word of God, okay, my mind gets a little mushy and I start making decisions based upon what I only see here versus what there is to come. I make bad choices when I get away from God's Word. Guess what? So do you. Okay? So do you. Times in which I stray the most is times in which I'm not reading. I'm reading the least. Right? That's why I make it a habit of reading His Word every day because I need His wisdom to remind me of what matters. This is why we read, so we can be coached, so we can be trained, so that we can renew our mind. So his word is given for receiving instruction to do what is righteous and also what is just. The purpose of Proverbs is to coach you to see truth clearly. This is what it means by being just. Part of our problems in decision-making is not understanding the truth of what is. We think we know something, but that's not actually true. You will make a flawed choice with flawed information. So the Proverbs will coach you to see situations and events and people Clearly, you make judgments about things every single day, whether you like that person or not. What you think they're doing is right, or how you should approach this other situation. You will approach people in situations incorrectly if you do not see the truth clearly, what is happening here. God's Word will help us, and Proverbs in particular will help us to see clearly so we can do what is just and also and fair. The purpose of Proverbs is to coach you to be impartial. How many bad choices have you made because you were biased, right? You're biased towards your Facebook friends so you only post things that they will like. This is how we get siloed communities. We're biased towards our tribe, biased towards what we already believe or towards what we think is true. This is problematic all of the time. We want to believe something is true, so therefore we're more prone to gravitate towards that information that already confirms our bias. It's called confirmation bias. It's problematic where people then only see something this way because they only want to see it this way. Okay? And therefore, our decisions are not based on the totality of the truth. 
and we're biased, and we start to silo, and now we have camps, and now we have tribes, and now we have all of this divisions. Is our country a little divided, you think? Divided. How can we see something and see it so differently? Because we have been trained to think a certain way, right? It's a problem. How can we become so biased? Because we only want to see this. We don't want to know the truth. We want to prove our point. Hear that. We don't want to know the truth. <laughs> the truth may mean that I have to change my opinion, and I don't want to change my opinion, because if I change my opinion, my friends might, might not like me. So therefore, I'm going to believe this and call it truth and then prove my point. We need more people who are more interested in the truth than they are in their own point. You're welcome. <laughs> Guys are like, dude, I'm just telling you. The problem. So here's the invitation. I'm going to sum up the whole first point. Okay? The wisdom of God is given to us so that we would have the ability to know what to do. <laughs> that we would be coached to be disciplined so that we can excel. That we can understand complex things with the intent of making choices that helps life to run smoothly. smoothly. The wisdom of God shows us what is right and righteous to clearly see the truth and to make impartial decisions that are fair to all. Do we need more people like this? 100%. Why don't we become those people? Why don't we give ourselves over to say, God, I want to be like this. And this is the invitation. And we'll see it throughout this book where wisdom calls, it calls, it calls, stands on the street corners, gets up on a box and says, hey, come listen to me. And how often we'd rather go watch YouTube, right? I don't got time for that because I'm too busy because I'm scrolling. Right? Come on. I'll get to that later. Unfortunately, later often doesn't come or it comes too later. <laughs> oh, I wish I would have. The world says live and learn. God says, learn and live. Learn and live. And so there's this emphatic urgency to this book. Hey, listen, read, pay attention to these things. Reap the rewards from the book of Proverbs. Up to you, they're there. Are you giving yourself to this word, to his word? Second, respond to the invitation from the book of Proverbs. Read the rewards. Respond to the invitation. So Solomon, or the writer of this, right, the compiler says, hey, I want you to know why this is written. It'll help you. It'll coach you. It'll strengthen you. It'll protect you. Give yourself to it and it says, okay, now respond to this invitation. And they're all types of people who are listed here for us. Now listen for the category that you're in. Let's continue with verse 4, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 4. For giving prudence to those who are simple, one category. Knowledge and discretion to the young, second category. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, third category. And let the discerning get guidance, fourth category. 
for understanding proverbs and parables and sayings and riddles of the wise. So an invitation to four categories of people here. For giving prudence to those who are simple. The gullible are invited so that you can gain discernment. Now, no one's going to volunteer for this category, right? That's me, right? But some of you are gullible, okay? You believe stuff inherently. Some of you take on the same opinion of the last person you interacted with. You're like a chameleon, taking on the color of the last thing you came in contact with. I know people like this. I can tell the last person they talk to because of what comes out of their mouth. Oh, you just talked to John, didn't you? And then all of a sudden they go talk to Phil, and all of a sudden they're saying something else. And then they go talk to Larry, and now they're saying something else. And then they go talk to Phil in the blank, right? These are... People like a, uh, uh, um, a reed. <laughs> the wind blows this way and they bend that way. The wind blows this way and they bend that way. The wind blows this way and they bend that way. Right? Now, should you seek the truth? Absolutely. But sometimes people just believe something because someone made a YouTube video of it. Dr. So-and-so. Really? Who says? Well, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Really? (laughs) Think! Well, others of you, are we've become simple in our thinking because we don't know the other side of the argument. We don't take time to fully consider the other side. (laughs) We get in so much trouble because we're gullible. Why do you think you get robocalls? Because people answer the robocalls. What? Yeah. Here's my credit card number. They're not your friend. I have a good friend of mine who's a police officer in in, uh, Minneapolis. He was assigned to the phone fraud, fraud division. He says millions and billions of dollars are generated. You know why they keep doing this? Because you keep picking up the phone. That's why they do it. Let's go back to this. We're simple in our thinking because we don't know the other side of the argument. You know your side really well, but do you know the other side of the argument? Why do you think people think differently than you? Well, because they're dumb. Really? Can you tell me why they believe what they believe? No, really understand why. We don't care to know because we're beating our drum. So people listen to us because we're right. Well, you can come to that conclusion if you can tell me why the other side believes what they believe. It's getting quiet in here. <clears throat> a wise person looks at an issue from all sides to gain understanding from multiple directions. It's a point of education. Gaining knowledge so you can apply wisdom. The best thing about education is teaching you how to learn, not necessarily education or information itself. So I want you to think about your life. Are you in this category? Are you swayed and swayed and swayed? Or are you thinking and making a decision based on really processing? The gullible are invited so that you can gain discernment. If you are simple, read this book. Respond to this invitation. Second category, knowledge and discretion to the young. The young are invited so that you can gain knowledge 
and discretion. Don't you love children? Okay? They typically say whatever comes through their mind, right? They're wonderfully naive and sometimes super funny, right? No filters. Hi. You have bad breath, right? Thank you. <laughs> they just tell you whatever. Now, it's cute when it's a three-year-old, but it's not cute when it's a 33-year-old. <laughs> Have a little discernment, a little discretion. <laughs> the young are invited so that you can gain knowledge and discretion. So if you are young in this place, learn. You are still learning, and you're growing. You know that we have one verse in the Bible that governs Jesus' growing up years. We have one verse. We know a lot about Jesus when he was young, right? We know about the stable. We know about the star. We know about the wise men. We know about that. Then we see Jesus when he's 12 years old in the temple, right? Remember this? So we know what he was seeking, okay? And then we have one verse from when he's 12 to about when he's 30. One verse! Right? So that one verse governs his growing up years from 12 to 30, his young years. And this is what it says. It's Luke 2.52. Jesus grew. Okay, this is a whole other sermon, but I'm giving it to you right now. Jesus grew in wisdom And he grew in stature, and he grew in favor with God and man. Jesus grew, this is Jesus, grew in wisdom and stature and favor of God and man, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. If you want a purpose statement, parents, of how to raise your kids, choose Luke 2.52. Four areas. Knowledge and discretion to the young. Jesus memorized scripture and learned from it, and we are to learn from it as well. And how is it that often when people turn 18, they think they know everything? Or 16, or 13... Right? Well, I got it. My parents don't know nothing. <laughs> Come talk to me in 30 years. See how much your parents knew. So if you're young, give yourself. Hey, you got a lot of stuff to learn, so learn it. Don't come across like you know everything. Be quiet, listen, learn, and grow. So this book is given to the second category for those who are young. Third, let the wise Listen and add to their learning. Some of you are in this category. The wise are invited so that you can gain more wisdom. Part of growing wise is coming to the understanding that the more you know and realize, you realize the more you don't know. Okay? A dark place is to not know what you do not know. Just let, think about that. It's a dark place not to know what you do not know. The thing about education, again, is you learn, the far, farther you go, right? When we're younger, we learn um, a lot of things. And then we go and we learn a lot more things, get more narrow. And then we go, like, get a, if you get an undergrad degree, you get more narrow. You get a graduate degree, you get more narrow. If you get a doctorate, you know a lot about a little. <laughs> okay. Why? The more you realize, the more you realize that you don't realize everything. Even if you are a super genius, you know a very, very small amount. And all there is to know. 
And how often are we relying on our own understanding against God who knows everything about everything? This is what humility comes to. So the wise, they understand, they know some things, but they don't know everything. But the wise listen and add to their learning. Some of you have been around for 90 plus years. You have become very wise, but there's still more for you to learn. I heard a story of a guy in his 90s who was literally in hospice, and he was reading a massive book. And his grandson asked him, Why are you reading this book, Grandpa? You're going to die soon. And he says, To improve my mind, son, to improve my mind mind. There's always more that you can learn, so don't become overly entertained. One of the problems with our country is that we are overly entertained and undereducated. That's a good amen spot. It's interesting that even people who write magazines like Time magazine, okay, They'll put one cover for America, like typically of a celebrity, and they'll have the same information, the different, excuse me, some different information, a different cover in the same edition for the rest of the world of something more substantial because they know if they put something substantial on the cover of Time, Americans won't buy it. So they put an entertainer on there or a sports figure. I'm just telling you, you know why? <laughs> so I'm kind of I'm soapboxing. Guess I am preaching, but. Uh, Wonder why some of the rest of the world's eating our lunch? Because we're love to be entertained, but we really don't like to be educated. God help us to be wise. So if you're wise, it's for you. Next category, last category. And let the discerning get guidance. So if you're discerning, you're invited. So that you will gain greater insight. If you're already discerning, and some of you are, read this book. You don't know it all. You'll gain greater insight. There's always more to know, and there's always ways to grow. If you're discerning, read this book. Respond to the invitation. Become more discerning. And he sums up this invitation with these words. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. You are invited to gain understanding of difficult, nuanced complexities. God is inviting you to gain the knowledge and wisdom to comprehend a thing, how it relates to another and when I went to get a graduate degree, I had to take a test called the Miller Analogies Test. Anyone heard of this test? Okay. Nobody. Guess it's in Minnesota. Okay. I had to go and take this test to see if I was qualified to go into grad school. And so it was, we got in a room, okay, you know how they do, and they separate everybody. I had to go to the local college, get down, get a pencil, and it's 50 questions. And if you got like 30 of the 50, you're a genius. Okay. So how this test works, and you go to the next slide, it is this relates to blank. Here it is, as this relates to blank. And you have to fill in the blank. For instance, this is one of an easier one. Okay. So a mason relates to blank as a carpenter relates to wood. Okay, I'm talking about this because you have to understand the nuances. Okay, so we know that carpenter is connected to wood. Well, what does a carpenter do with wood? Well, uses it, right? Okay, so what does a mason do? So is the answer mason relates to iron as carpenter relates to wood? Wow, you guys are on this. You're like, I know the answer. Right, it's not iron, because a mason, you have to know something about a mason. Right, mason works with, thank you. Well, you guys already know, right? 
But you have to understand mason, and you have to understand what a carpenter is, you have to understand what wood is, and then you have to understand they're relating. So mason is not iron. Mason to chisel? Well, oh, wait a second. That's a tool used. Do they, masons use chisels? Well, no. It's usually a trowel, so that can't be it. Mason uh, to stone, right? It's not to building. It's not a carpenter is to chair as a mason is to a building. So it's stone, okay? So that's an easier one. Then you get questions like this. <laughs> Blank is to innocuous, as reprehensible is to praiseworthy. What? So is it pretentious? Virulent, I can't even say this. Antiseptic? Widespread. You have to know a lot about these words and how they relate to one another. We're not going to work through this one, by the way. You're like, what's the answer? Go look it up, okay? What? I'm not going to do all this for you. Come on. There are things out there that are hard to understand. <laughs> they found that most Americans don't read. If You do the same thing. If you're going through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, you know, if it's longer than three paragraphs, I don't got time for that, right? Don't we do that? It's pathetic. I want a picture <laughs> or a video. That's even better. I don't have to think it's hard. This is the problem, by the way. We don't read. Or we read very little. Or I only can handle 144 characters because too much will blow my brain. Really? Isn't that a problem? It's a problem. Do you want to expand your mind? Read the book. Go to the coach. Last main point. You guys are sticking with me. I know there's a lot. Okay. Advertisement. This is what Proverbs will do for you. This is what God's word will do for you. Help you, coach you, discipline you, instruct you encourage you. Who is it for? The simple, the young, the wise, the discerning. It covers all the categories. It's for you. Recognize the foundation of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 1.7. So it gives this invitation, then he starts in and said, this is what this is about. The fear of the Lord is the beginning, is the foundation of knowledge. But fools, there's another category, people who just shun it, despise wisdom and instruction. Not just resist it, but despise it. So this is the major theme in Proverbs. Proverbs. It comes up 20 times in 31 chapters. So the book of Proverbs opens with the fear of the Lord as the beginning of knowledge. And then the book closes with the praise of the woman who fears the Lord. Opens with it, closes with it. Everything in between reminds the reader again and again and again and again that one does right, not only because it benefits others and ultimately benefits oneself, but because it pleases God. So let's talk about this. Why is the fear of the Lord the beginning of knowledge. Why isn't it the Lord is the beginning of knowledge? That makes sense. Why isn't it the love of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge? Because that makes sense. Or the grace of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. <laughs> what is it about the fear of the Lord that makes for the beginning of knowledge. Why is the fear of the Lord the place that true knowledge flows from? 
the source or the foundation that knowledge is built upon. Think about that. Fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord recognizes our place in the universe. That there is a God and you're not Him. The fear of the Lord recognizes that we are utterly dependent creatures on an utterly sufficient God. That He is perfect and we are not. That He is holy and we are not. That He is the source of everything and we are not. He is glorious and we are not. The fear of the Lord is when we realize I and you are not the measure of all things. But that we are being Measured. In Him are all things. And all things flow from Him. All things are found in Him. In Him we live and move and have our being. Thank you, Acts chapter 17. All things were created through Him and for Him and in Him holds all things together. He's before all things. That He is to be honored and reverenced and fear. The fear of the Lord captures both aspects of shrinking back in fear and drawing close in awe. There is a combination of these things, of recognizing who He is and who we are, and then being drawn to Him in reverent submission. Jesus taught us not to fear, but also what to truly Fear. Matthew 10, 28. Said, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. <laughs> All fear is not bad. The foolish person fears nothing. The wise person fears the right thing. Because you have faith, you will have fear. Fear of the living God. The wise person knows when to be afraid. The fool fears nothing. Or the wrong thing things and pays the price. The smartest, wisest people build their life upon the Word of God. Have any of you heard about the Sermon on the Mount? Anyone hear about that? It's really famous, right? It starts out with the Beatitudes, right? Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. You've heard it said, but I tell you. You've heard it said, but I tell you. You've heard it said, but I tell you. Blessed is the one who is pure in heart, for they will see God. And he tells some stories. And at the very end, there's a very famous one. It's about the wise and foolish builder. Those of you who grew up in Sunday school know the song. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Loved that when I was a kid. So cool, right? We built houses on rocks. It was great. But the foolish person built their house upon the what? You guys know that one. You've been to Sunday school. 
So Jesus tells this parable. He says, all of these things, okay? He says, now you have a choice. You can either build your house upon your own wisdom, your own words, your own thoughts, and you can build, and people do it all the time. But in the end, it's all coming down. We're seeing this right now where some of the wealthiest people in the world are losing their marriages, losing their reputation, losing their money. They built a really, really nice house, but in the end, it all comes down. You are building a life. Every one of us is building a life. The question is not, are you building? The question is, on what foundation are you building your life? Are you building it upon your own thoughts? And there's people all the time, very rich and wealthy and famous and powerful people, that when the wind blows and when they are truly tested, it will all fall down because none of it was built to glorify God or on His Word. Wisdom or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge because that is the only foundation in which you can build your life. If you're fearing the wrong things and not fearing the God above, you're going to crash. When you fear the Lord... You make choices that honor the Lord. You see in Scripture where it talks about the fear of God not being in a place and it becomes demonic and destructive and abusive because people think that they're the measure of all things. Well, welcome to relativism, which is a common theory in our time. That we're the standard. If we all vote, let's step on some toes here, but get ready. You have already stepped on our toes, so I'm going to step on some more. If we all vote that you know a homosexual lifestyle is okay, then we say it's okay, so therefore it's okay. If we all vote. That, hmm, okay, got to be a little careful. At the end of the day, God's word is the final word. I'll say that. Good luck in trying to convince God to think about things the way you think about them. Well, God, let me correct you and your thoughts on that. I'm sure God's going to say, oh, please, tell me. Please inform me of something. Foolish person despises wisdom. (laughs) What are you building your life upon? Have any of you um, heard of this song that Johnny Cash recorded? It's called Hurt. Has any of you heard that song? I remember hearing this back in the, I think it was the 90s. Right now it has, I looked it up, 106 million views on it. It's powerful. The first time I saw it, I cried. Do you know anything about Johnny Cash? He didn't write this song, but he recorded it. I encourage you to go look at it. You'll be sobered. It's called Hurt. Some of the lines are, by become. And you see this video of his life and his museums and stuff. My sweetest friend. Everyone I know goes away in the end. And you could have it all. (laughs) My empire of dirt. I will let you down. I will make you hurt. I wear this crown of thorns upon my liar's chair, full of broken thoughts I cannot 
repair. I don't want that to be the theme song of your life. A couple more things about the fear of the Lord, and I have to come in for a landing. <laughs> this is about the Messiah. <clears throat> it's really curious. Isaiah chapter 11, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, <laughs> the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verse 3, And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Let's stop there. Jesus' delight was in the fear of the Lord? I don't know about you, but I don't really delight in it. God help us to delight. His delight? Everything Jesus did, he did to glorify his Father. Father, your will, not mine. He wanted to serve him. He wanted to honor him. He wanted to glorify him because he knew the Father and his glory. He knew his majesty. He knew his might. And out of love and out of grace and out of mercy, he delighted in the fear of the Lord. From this delight is the foundation of wisdom. And from fearing the Lord came understanding and counsel and might. In the twelve, excuse me, in the ten plagues that God demonstrated through Moses and Aaron, if you read them, it gets worse, they get worse, they get worse, they get worse. And right around six or seven, says that Pharaoh did not yet fear him. So God demonstrated his power to Pharaoh that he would fear him. This is Exodus chapter 9. So this man would understand the glory of God. It would have been better for Pharaoh to have understood who he was dealing with, the true living God, and says, he wants you to go, then go. See, in the Old Testament, the Jehoshaphat, a king, prayed the fear of the Lord would be upon the judges so that they would be judged right and truly. It's a good prayer for our judges. Have you ever prayed that our judges would fear the Lord so that they could judge rightly? The fear of the Lord is described as being clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. And we'll get to that. Think about that. Fear of the Lord is demonstrated in hating evil. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. The fear of the Lord gives us strong confidence. It is a refuge and fountain of life. Proverbs 22, the reward of humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. We'll talk about that later as well. We have to come in for a landing, so we're going to land. I know this is a lot. So I pray that you'll give yourself to wisdom. Okay. Here's, here's a simple application, okay? and, and some people do this, and I encourage you to do this. And let's do this together for at least this series. How many chapters are there in Proverbs? 31. What's the longest month we have? How many days? 31. So it makes it really easy. So today is what, the 23rd? Guess what you read? Chapter 23 of Proverbs. Guess what day it is tomorrow? Date. 24th. What do you read? Chapter 24 of Proverbs. Why don't we do that for the next several months to say, okay, we're going to read a proverb, okay? So in your daily Bible reading, which all of you are doing, right? Pick up a chapter and read it. What date's today? Okay. Well, this month only has 28. Well, you can read a few more extra chapters. You'll be okay. Read it. Practical application. I, would pr I pray that you accept the invitation to learn. Pray 
that you would have a deep and abiding fear of the Lord. You want to pray something, pray that for yourself. Pray that for a congregation. Pray that, that we grow in understanding of this. I want you to invite, excuse me, to accept the invitation to know him and to walk in his way. And if you do not know him this day, today is your day. I don't know all of you, okay? Looking forward to getting to know each other more. But you might be here and say, you know, I don't know. I'm not afraid of anything. Well, you need to understand who God is and understand who Jesus is and ask, understand what Jesus did for us. So today could be your day. You say, you know what? I want to mo- know more about this living God. I want to know more about this one named Jesus. I want to follow in his way. New person. First time. If you're here, say, I want to do that. I just want you to raise your hand. Okay. Maybe all of you are good in here. Okay. I'm going to pray for us all now. So let's pray. God, I ask your forgiveness for those of us who have become overly familiar and have lost our sense of awe of you. God, I ask that you would open our eyes that we could see you. Understand you truly. You are gracious. You are kind. You are righteous. You are powerful. You are all these things and more in your multifaceted perfection. And you showed yourself by your Son. And you've given yourself to your Spirit. You spoke to us through prophets, through apostles, by your Spirit, through your Son, and you still speak to us today. Forgive us of our puny understanding of you. Open our eyes, open our heart, open our very spirit. And I ask God that this church specifically here in this place, those listening, that we would be people who give ourselves over to your word being discipled by it and then being empowered by your spirit. Fill us anew this day. Conform us anew this day. Forgive us of our sin and our pompous arrogance and our simple-minded approach, and our lack of love based on the hardness of our hearts. Give us grace, we pray. Make us wise, we ask. We thank you for your word and your wisdom and your goodness to us. Be glorified in all things, in Jesus' name.